Yeah, it's time for chapter six, but I've got something to show you first. It's rather, I'm rather pleased with this. Here is an egg. See, see my egg? Now, if you go like this, it turns into a chicken. It's a bit of a funny beak. I'm not sure what happened there, but I thought you might like that. And then when you get fed up of looking at the chicken, you just go, toodaloo, and he goes, back in the egg. I thought you'd like that. Right, so, more Tom's Midnight Garden, chapter five, through a door. There's a picture here of Tom. It looks like he's having a ride in a wheelbarrow. So, for to find out whether the chap pushing the wheelbarrow can see Tom or not. Because the maid couldn't see him earlier, could she? Now then. Every night now, Tom slipped downstairs to the garden. At the first, he used to be afraid that it might not be there. Once, with his hand already upon the garden door to open it, he had turned back, sick with grief at the very thought of absence. He had not dared then to look, but later the same night he had forced himself to go on again and open that door, and there the garden was. It had not failed him. He saw the garden at many times of its day, and at different seasons. Its favourite season was summer with perfect weather. In earliest summer, hyacinths were still out in the crescent beds on the lawn, and wallflowers in the round ones. Then the hyacinths bowed and died, and the wallflowers were uprooted, and stocks and asters bloomed in their stead. There was a clipped box bush by the greenhouse, with a cavity like a great mouth cut into the side of it. This was stacked full of pots of geraniums in flower. Along the sundial path, heavy red poppies came out, and roses, and in summer dusk the evening primroses glimmered like little moons. In the latest summer, the pears on the wall were muffled in muslin bags for safe ripening. Tom was not a gardener, however. His first interest in a garden, as Peter's would have been, was tree climbing. He always remembered his first tree in this garden, one of the ewes round the lawn. He had never climbed a ewe before, and was inclined to think ever afterwards that ewes were best. The first branches grew conveniently low, and the main trunk had bosses and crevices. With the toes of his left foot fitted into one of these last, Tom curved his hands round a branch over his head. Then he gave a push, a spring, and a strong haul on the arms. His legs and feet were dangling free, and the branch was under his chest and then under his middle. He drew himself further forward, and at the same time twisting himself expertly. Now he was sitting on the bow, at man's height above the ground. The rest of the ascent was easy but interesting, sometimes among the spreading outermost branches, sometimes working close to the main trunk. Tom loved the dry feel of the bark on the main trunk. In places the bark had peeled away, and then a deep pink showed beneath, as though the tree were skin and flesh beneath its brown. Up he went, up and up and burst at last from the dim interior into an openness of blue and fiery gold. The sun was the gold in a blue sky. All round him was a spreading, tufted surface of evergreen. He was on a level with the top of the tall south wall. Tom was on a level too, with the upper windows of the house just across the lawn from him. His attention was caught by a movement inside one of the rooms. It came, he saw, from the same maid he had once seen in the hall. She was dusting a bedroom, and came now to the window to raise the sash and shake her duster outside. She looked casually across to the yew trees as she did so, and Tom tried waving to her. It was like waving to the he in Blind Man's Buff. The maid went back into the depths of the room to her dusting. She left the window open behind her and Tom could now see more. There was someone else in the room besides the maid, someone who stood against the far wall facing the window. The maid evidently spoke to her companion occasionally as she worked, for Tom could hear the faint coming and going of voices. He could not see the figure at all clearly, except that it was motionless, and there was the whiteness and shape of a face that was always turned in his direction. That steadfastness of direction embarrassed Tom, very gradually, he began to draw his head downwards, and then suddenly ducked it below tree level altogether. Tom saw more people later in the garden itself. 
He stalked them warily, and yet, remembering his invisibility to the housemaid, with a certain confidence too. He was pretty sure that the garden was used more often than he knew. He often had the feeling of people having just gone, and an uncomfortable feeling, out of which he tried to reason himself again and again, of someone who had not gone, someone who, unobserved, observed him. It was a relief, really, to see people, even when they ignored his presence. The maid, the gardener, and a severe-looking woman in a long dress of ruffling purple silk, face to face with whom Tom once came unexpectedly on a corner. She cut him dead. Visibility, invisibility. If he were invisible to the people of the garden, he was not completely so, at least to some of the other creatures. How truly they saw him, he could not say but birds cocked their heads at him and flew away when he approached. And had he any bodily weight in this garden, or had he not? At first Tom thought not. When he climbed the yew tree, he had been startled to feel that no bough swung beneath him, and not a twig broke. Later, and this was a great disappointment to him, he found that he could not, by the ordinary grasping and pushing of his hand, open any of the doors in the garden to go through them. He could not push open the door of the greenhouse or of the little heating house behind it, or the door in the south wall by the sundial. The doors shut against Tom were a check upon his curiosity, until he saw a simple way out. He would get through the doorways that interested him by following at the heels of the gardener. He regularly visited the greenhouse, the heating house, and used the south wall door. Tom concentrated upon getting through the south wall door. That entry promised to be the easiest because the gardener went through so often with his tools. There must be a tool shed somewhere through there. The gardener usually went through so quickly and shut the door so smartly behind him that there was not time for anyone else to slip through as well. However, he would be slower with a wheelbarrow, Tom judged, and he waited patiently for that opportunity. Yet even then the man somehow only made a long arm to open the door ahead of the wheelbarrow, wheeled it very swiftly through, caught the door edge with the toe of his boot as he passed, and slammed the door in Tom's face. Tom glared at the door that once more was his barrier. Once more without hope, he raised his hand to the latch and pressed it. As usual, he could not move it. His fingers seemed to have no substance. Then, in anger, he pressed with all imaginable might. He knitted his brows and brought all his will to bear upon the latch, until he felt that something had to happen. It did. His fingers began to go through the latch, as though the latch, and not his fingers now, were without substance. His fingers went through the ironwork of the latch altogether, and his hand fell back in place by his side. Tom stared down at that ever-memorable right hand. He felt it tenderly with his left to see if it were bruised or broken. It was quite unhurt, quite as before. Then he looked at the latch. It looked as real as any latch he had ever seen anywhere. Then the idea came to Tom that the door might be no more solid than the latch, if he really tried. Deliberately, he set his side against the door, shoulder, hip and heel, and pressed. At first nothing gave, either of himself or the door, yet he continued the pressure with still greater force and greater determination, and gradually he became aware of a strange sensation that at first he thought was a numbness all down his side. But no, it was not that. I'm going through, Tom gasped, and was seized with alarm and delight. Oh. Our next door neighbours have switched their hot tub on, so you might hear a funny noise in the background. Don't be alarmed. On the other side of the wall, the gardener had emptied his wheel barrow load of weeds and was sitting on the handle of his barrow in front of a potting shed, eating his midday dinner. If he'd been able to see Tom at all, he would have seen a most curious sight, a very thin slice of a boy, from shoulder to foot coming through a perfectly solid wooden door. At first the body came through evenly from top to bottom, then the upper part seemed to stop, and then the bottom part came through in its entirety, legs first. Then one arm came through, then another. Finally, everything was going through except the head. The truth was that Tom was now lacking courage. Passing through the door of so much of his body had not been without enormous effort, 
and peculiar if indescribable sensations. I'm just resting a minute, said Tom's head on the garden side of the door, yet he knew that he was really delaying because he was nervous. His stomach, for instance, had felt most uncomfortable as it passed through the door. What would the experience be like for his head, his eyes, his ears? On the other hand, and the new idea was even worse than the old, supposing that, like a locomotive engine losing steam pressure, he lost his present force of body and willpower in this delay. Then he would be unable to move either forwards or backwards. He would be caught here by the neck, perhaps forever. And just supposing someone came along on the far side of the wall, who by some evil chance could see him, supposing a whole company came, they would see an entirely defenceless stern sticking out, an invitation to ridicule and attack. With a convulsive effort, eyes closed, lips sealed, Tom dragged his head through the door and stood dizzy, dazed, but whole, on the far side of it. When his vision cleared, he saw that he was standing directly in front of the potting shed and the gardener. Tom had never been front to front with a gardener before. He was a large-framed young man with a weather-reddened face and eyes the colour of the sky itself. They now looked straight through Tom and far away. Into his mouth he was putting the last fragments of a thick bacon and bread sandwich. He finished the sandwich, closed his eyes and spoke aloud. For all good things I thank the Lord, and may he keep me from all the works of the devil that he hurt me not. He spoke with a country voice, clipping Shorts's T's and widening his vowels, so that Tom had to listen attentively to understand him. The gardener opened his eyes again and reaching behind him brought out another sandwich. Tom wondered in some surprise whether he said grace after every sandwich. Perhaps he never knew how many he was going to eat. The gardener went on eating and Tom turned away to look at it. He was in an orchard but also served for the keeping of hens, the pegging out of washing and the kindling of a bonfire. Beyond the orchard were meadows and trees, from among which rose the roofs of what must be a village. While he looked, Tom was also keeping a sharp eye upon the gardener. When the man had really finished his meal, he grasped the handles of his wheelbarrow to return to his work in the garden. In a moment, Tom was beside him. He had not at all enjoyed the experience of going through a shut door, and he did not now intend to have to repeat it. This time there was an easy way through. He got nimbly up into the empty barrow and was wheeled back into the garden in comfort. It was a long time before Tom literally forced his way through a door again. Anyway, he had seen the orchard and that was enough in that direction. Other doors could wait. Meanwhile, he climbed the low wall at the bottom of the garden and explored the woods beyond. On the third side of the garden, he wormed his way through the hedge again and crossed a meadow. The only surprise there was the boundary. A river, clear, gentle flowing, shallow, green with reeds and water plants. The garden and its surroundings then were not in themselves outside the natural order of things, nor was Tom alarmed by his own unnatural abilities. Yet to some things his mind came back again and again, troubled. The constant fine weather, the rapid coming and going of the seasons and the times of the day, and the feeling of being watched. One night, all his uneasiness came to a head. He had gone from his bed in the flat upstairs and crept down to the hall at about midnight as usual. He had opened the garden door. He had found for the first time that it was night too in the garden. The moon was up, but clouds fled continuously across its face. Although there was this movement in the upper air, down below there was none. A great stillness lay within the garden, and the heavier beat heat than at any noon. Tom felt it. He unbuttoned his pyjama jacket and let it flap open as he walked. One could smell the storm coming. Before Tom had reached the bottom of the garden, the moon had disappeared, obscured altogether by cloud. In its place came another light that seemed instantaneously to split the sky from top to bottom, and a few seconds later came the thunder. Tom turned back to the house. As he reached the porch, the winds broke out into the lower air with heavy rain and the deathly chilling of the temperature. Demons of the air seemed let loose in that garden, 
and with the increasing frequency of the lightning, Tom watched the foliage of the trees ferociously tossed and torn at by the wind, and at the corner of the lawn, the tall, tapering fir tree swinging to and fro, its ivy-wreathed arms struggling wildly in the tempest like the arms of a swaddling child. To Tom, it seemed that the fir tree swung more widely each time. It can't be blown over, thought Tom. Strong trees are not often blown over. As if in answer to this, and while the wind still tore, there came the loudest thunder, with a flash of lightning that was not to one side, nor even above, but seemed to come down into the garden itself to the tree. The glare was blinding, and Tom's eyes closed against it, although only for part of a second. When he opened them again, he saw the tree like one flame and falling. In the long instance while it fell, there seemed to be a horrified silence of all the winds, and in that quiet, Tom heard something, a human cry, and, oh, of the terror he felt himself. It came from above him, from the window of one of the upper rooms. Then the fir tree fell, stretching its length, although Tom did not know this until much later, along the grave beds of the asparagus in the kitchen garden. It fell in darkness and the resumed rushing of the wind and rain. Tom was shaken by what he had seen and heard. He went back into the house and shut the garden door behind him. Inside, the grandfather clock ticked peacefully. The hall was still. He wondered if perhaps he had only imagined what he had seen outside. He opened the door again and looked out. The summer storm was still raging. The flashes of lightning were distant now. They lit up the ugly gap in the trees round the lawn where the fir tree had stood. The tree had fallen. That had been a t sight terrible enough. But the cry from above troubled Tom even more. On the next night came the greatest shock of all. He opened the garden door as usual and surveyed the garden. At first he did not understand what was odd in its appearance. Then he realised that its usual appearance was in itself an oddity. In the trees round the lawn there was no gap. The ivy-grown fir tree still towered above them. The mystery. So, I'll see you soon for chapter 7. Bye-bye.